Can we all take a moment to respect and love all the crap we put our paperbacks through? Oh. Oh. Yikes. I'm so sorry. It's worn down with love. Oh, and please don't be one of those people. How could you do that to your book? Do you dog ear them? Yes, I dog ear my books and I read them a lot, so sometimes I get worn down because they're made out of paper and because I pick my battles with life. One of the battles I decide to pick is that I want my paperback novels to remain perfect. I will lose every single one and just go insane. So, yeah, I don't care that much. Welcome back to Let's Reread Percy Jackson and the Olympians. Today we are talking about Sea of Monsters. I love Sea of Monsters, okay? I love this book. I love so many things about this book. This is my, one second, I'm doing math, third favorite book in the series. After the Last Olympian and the Battle of the Labyrinth. So much cool stuff. As much as I love The Lightning Thief, and I do love The Lightning Thief, you know, see my other video. I feel like this is when things really take off. First of all, and you guys reminded me, nothing like the names of the chapters. My best friend shops for a wedding dress. Demon pigeons attack. We hitch a ride with dead confederates. We meet the sheep of doom. The party ponies invade. Okay, where to begin? The beginning. Good place to start. Grover is so annoying. I was right. It wasn't just that, like, oh, am I, is it just because it's lightning thief? It's the first book? No, no, no. Grover's just really, really obnoxious. I, how have I not noticed this? I don't know what happened. Like, the first time I read it, I, it's not that I loved Grover. I just didn't, I just didn't notice it. I, I don't know. And I, now, I specifically remember him doing really cool stuff in the end, so maybe that's what happened. Maybe I got to the end and I just was like, oh, who cares? He's so cool now, it doesn't matter. And you know what? That might be my attitude towards him in the end. But as of right now, oh my gosh, Grover. Why are you so annoying? But it's really sweet for Percy to go out of his way to save him anyway. Percy's a good person. So I've always, opposite of Grover, loved Tyson. There's something about Tyson that you just... You can't hate. Like, maybe he can come off as obnoxious. Sorry, it sounded like I had some weird accent. Come off as, come off as obnoxious, but not, not to me. Cause Tyson, Tyson doesn't know better. And yet, still somehow more competent than Grover. I don't understand. But anyway, this begins our journey with Tyson, the Cyclops. I love Tyson. Big fan of Tyson's character. So happy he was in the Heroes of Olympus. Just, I love Tyson. I remember getting mad when Percy kind of gets annoyed with Tyson. Like, oh gosh, now everybody thinks I'm a loser. It's like, Percy, let's not pretend like you don't know what that feels like. But then you get that thing I talked about in the last video where people are slowly forgetting, oh yeah, you're not supposed to mess with Percy Jackson because he can mess you up. Doesn't happen very often after this. And then we have the taxi cab and chariot races and the Bermuda Triangle. This is such a flipping good book. Oh my gosh. And flipping Tantalus. <sighs> Although Tantalus does lead to one of my favorite lines in this entire series. Uh, let me read it to you. Yes, here we go. This was so completely unfair I told Tantalus to go chase a donut, which didn't help his mood. <laughs> Classic Percy. I also, this time around, hate Clarice a little bit less. I think when you're a little bit younger you see her as a bully, but when you're a little bit older you're just like, well, you're just kind of a sad person. And besides, we know, if you've read it anyway, we know how she ends up. We, we know we've seen the softer, softer side of Clarice. So now we can kind of sympathize with these Clarices. Now this is a good book because Rover's not there for a lot of it. And the original three people going on this quest is Annabeth, Percy, and Tyson. Like, yay. Love this trio. I like how Annabeth has to kind of get over her thing with psych. Cyclopsi? Cyclopsis? Cyclopsis? Cyclopsy? I've never pluralized Cyclops before. Maybe it's just Cyclopsis. You won't forget it. Anyway, so Annabeth kind of has to get over that, which I thought was really, really cool. I really like how Rick Riordan uses the Bermuda Triangle as an entrance into the Sea of Monsters, like how he incorporates that real life over and over and over again. I forgot one of my favorite parts in the series happens in this book. It's with Cece's spa. <laughs> I love guinea pig Percy so much. 
I don't know why that tickled me so much, but it was hilarious. I love when Percy gets turned into a guinea pig. These are the best kind of shenanigans. It's also interesting now that we know about like Cece's spa and the fact that uh, Reyna and her sister uh, worked there for a time or whatever. Actually, this book has a lot of just really, really good moments. Not really any boring moments. Uh, you hop right into it. Hermes kind of helps the gang out though. He's like, all right, here's some gummies. Here's a thing of air. Here's this. And you know, Rick Riordan doesn't really waste any time getting right back to Luke, which I like because that was a really big deal when you were reading it the first time. You were just like, what? Which is kind of stupid because it's super obvious, especially upon rereading it, that Luke was the one behind everything in The Lightning Thief, but anywho. So you just dive straight in, you go to the boot, the boot, the boat that Luke is in, and there's that, you know, big confrontation, and then that blows up, and then there's the Sea of Monsters, and there's Clarice with the Confederate ship, all very, very good things. Another one of my favorite parts is with the uh, the monster that sucks in the water and then uh, blows it back out. It is really cool. I forget the they're the sister monsters, you know. But um, this book also has. I know I've been saying that a lot, but I, I really mean it when I say one of my favorite moments in this whole series, if not my third favorite Percebeth moment, which is when they pass the sirens and Annabeth tries to swim to the island. This is such a good part because it doesn't just show Percy's determination as like a potential boyfriend. It's like I said before, Percy was Annabeth's best friend before he was ever her boyfriend. And I love that because more romantic character development should start there. You don't date boyfriends, you date your best friend. Isn't that right, Jordan? What? Love you too. So, yeah, that's a great part. Percy just like keeping her alive, comforting her, taking her back. I thought it was really brave of little Annabeth to, you know, try to take on the sirens, albeit a little stupid for someone who's supposed to be wise, but hey, whatever, you know. I also really like the sirens and that, how Rick Riordan describes how her desires are. It's not just like, you want riches and it's like you just want everything to be okay and you want your friends to be okay. It really shows how good of a person Annabeth is. Like she can come off as a brat, especially in these first few books, but slowly you see that side of her start to ebb away and you realize she's not really a brat so much as a survivor and she has built up a hard cold shell to, you know, get along. I was also, I remember reading this the first time and I was so happy Tyson came back. Oh my gosh. So happy. I was so worried because I love Tyson and I love Tyson and Percy's relationship. It's just, it's just good brotherly love. I approve. What else did I want to talk about? Oh yeah. One of my favorite references to Greek mythology actually happens in this book. I know I say that a lot, but I, I really mean it. Um, Hydra is one of them, but that's not what I'm talking about. I just love the big nobody argument uh, between Polyphemus. Well, how do you say it? So I guess some people say it Polyphemus and some people say Polyphemus or Polyphemus or whatever. You know what I mean, the big giant cyclops. I really liked that reference, uh, loved it. Just, uh, who's there? Nobody! And when he tries to marry Grover and then he tries to marry Clarice. Oh, Polyphemus. There's also a really big moment um, that kind of just indicates how big the story is going to get. Um, one thing the Percy Jackson world um, this this series does very, very, very well is the way it builds on tension. It's very Harry Potter-esque in that way. It starts out feeling like a children's story, like there are some pretty intense moments, but other than that, you're, you don't feel like the weight of this fictional world is on your shoulders as a reader. It's as you progress, you realize how deep and dark things are getting. And it starts about here. Uh, Poseidon sends Percy a letter and it just says, brace yourself. And it's like, that's when you know things are gonna go down. You can kind of feel it. Towards the end of this novel, you feel like it's about to get much bigger than it was before. And for those of you who have read this, we're going to lead into The Titan's Curse next week. Titan's Curse is a great book. Probably my least favorite in the series, but not because it's not great. It's, it's amazing. Probably because the absence of Annabeth, who I love, and it has nothing to do with writing, nothing like that, just personal preference. 
And the Titans curse is pretty intense. We got Bianca, Nico, who, oh my gosh, Nico is probably one of my favorite characters in this series. And then just pretty much everything. Um, Atlas is in that. That's a big deal. Um, Thalia. Uh, it's just, that novel's crazy because it comes out of one of the biggest cliffhangers ever, which is when Thalia comes back from being a tree. And suddenly we're no longer in this carefree, let's all go on a quest together world. Suddenly things are getting much bigger. It seems like this impending prophecy is falling apart on top of Percy and he has no idea what it is. So yeah, next week we're going to get into the Titan's Curse, which, brace yourself, as Poseidon said, this is where things get pretty heavy. Remember that right after the Titan's Curse comes the Battle of the Labyrinth. Oh my gosh, I love the Battle of the Labyrinth so much. I'm not even, honestly, I love The Last Olympian. I don't even know if I love it more than the Battle of the Labyrinth. I might like it equally. They might both be in first place. Either way, so excited. Things are about to get crazy. Thank you guys for tweeting me this week, your favorite parts in the Sea of Monsters. I picked up your tweet and your tweet, and I agree, Sirens is an awesome part. And I also agree, I love the part where Annabeth defends them in the beginning because they're besties. I love the besties. So as you're reading Titan's Curse, tweet me your favorite part and you might be featured on next week's video. That's really exciting, I think. I will put my Twitter down below. You can follow me or you cannot, you know, I don't keep track, it's fine. Let's dive in. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Best December ever. Mr. Jackson.